Acts chapter 25, starting with verse 23. I'd like to just read two of those verses and then um, take us off into prayer. Verse 23 says, And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice with great pomp, and was entered into the palace of hearing, with the place of hearing, with the chief captains, plural, and principal men of the city, at Festus's command, commandment, Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all the men which are present with us, ye see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying, and it's the word for yelling, shouting, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. Let's pause there and give you the opportunity to prepare your heart for the study of God's word by confessing all known sin before the Father and then asking that God might teach you. This is done in the secrecy of silent prayer. Father, we are very grateful for the opportunity to open up your word and to study it, to learn and to grow in our walk with you. You're so special, Father, as you come through the power of your Holy Spirit to teach us and to guide us that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for these men. Thank you for their commitment to your word, their love to study your word and to grow more like your Son. Thank you, Father. I pray your blessings upon each one. You know the need of each and every individual man in this room, and I pray that you might meet that need according to your kindness and your grace. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we've been looking at the Paul's imprisonment in Judea um, for some time now. Started back in chapter 21, verse 15. And we will, Lord willing, be ending this evening um, with chapter 26, verse 32, and be done with it. We start in with Paul's defense before Festus, um, which we began. Um, it's chapter 25, verses 1 through uh, 20. Seven, and we got as far as um, verse 22 last week, and uh, we'll pick it up right here with verse 23. 23 says, And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and the principal men of the city, at Festus' command, Paul was brought forth. The petty King Agrippa, minor king, uh, small, small provinces there in the Middle East. He doesn't have the power of his granddad, you know, who ruled all of Judea and had, had quite a bit of, of power. He is in a more, well, an easier job. He's living with his sister Bernice. Um, they are living in incest. She left her husband to move into this incest with her um, brother. Um, whether it was love or it was just simply lust, and the lust could be either of the flesh or of money uh, and power. Um, we don't know what the situation is, but she is with him even on this very occasion. They came King Agrippa and, and Bernice, and they came at this occasion displaying their position, displaying their robes, displaying their uh, ceremony. Did you see that? Has come, and Bernice with great pomp and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men. They entered in a... I, I just picture, you know, music being played and and people rising to their feet as the king and the, I guess you'd call her queen, comes through the door and uh, the, the way that they were 
um, treated by these Roman officials. These are mostly Roman officials. There probably were some um, Jewish officials there, but probably not to the quantity of the Romans present. Paul stood chained in formal audience room with Agrippa and Bernice, the high-ranking Roman officials, the leading men of the city. Um, it is assumed by the students of the Bible that there was probably up to five tribunes present because the, um, the tenth legion, very famous, you do some reading about the tenth legion and you're pretty impressed. I mean, it was led by Caesar Augustus and Tiberius led, led the tenth legion. They, beautiful record, but they were sent to Judea um, kind of a backwater place simply because one strong legion could hold this people group. In a few years, another legion will be sent alongside them to put down the war that starts in AD 66. So there's a guess they believe that there was probably five tribunes there, as it shows up in our text in verse uh, 23. It says, with the chief captains. You see, that's in the plural. We saw that name, chief captain, when we were back in Jerusalem. The chief captain who stepped in, the Chiliarch who stepped in and protected Paul, got him out of town with a cohort, a contingent of 400 soldiers and uh, 70 horsemen to get him out of town and get him safely to Caesarea. Well, now you see this is in the plural. It's not just one. Um, these chiliarchoi in the plural are commanders of thousands is what it means. Commanders of thousands. All this pompous show, I think, was rather lost in front of a simple itinerant preacher and a part-time tent maker. Festus told Agrippa that multitude of Jews, plethoros, plethoros, um, where we get our word plethora, a multitudes of Jews have urged that Paul should die. One commentator that I had said, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, and I have to agree 100%. I think he's trying to make this scene of pomp look like it has a real meaning, because its full purpose was simply to introduce Paul before Agrippa II. That's its only purpose. If you jump back up to verse 14, did you see that? And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause to the king, saying, there's a certain man left bonds by field. I don't want you to miss this. You see, King Agrippa II and his sweet little bride, um, Bernice, come to Caesarea basically to give deference to the new Roman proconsul, Okay. Porticus Festus had just arrived. He'd been there about three days. He goes to Jerusalem. Then he comes back after uh, about 10 days. He's, here he is. And, and um, Herod Agrippa II and his wife come to kind of pay respects to him. And look in verse 14. They had been there, Caesarea, for many days. You've had it happen. You get guests that come over to your house and stay with you a little longer than probably you would have been happy for them to do. They come and they spend time with you. And as they're spending time, the first few days, a chatter, 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 coffee's drank, and have a wonderful time. Out comes the cake. Um, but then after a few days, you just about uh, used up all the <laughs> different things that you meant to tell them about. And uh, you're kind of searching the back of your mind thinking, uh, I, 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 wonder, I wonder if they saw that new, new uh, chair in the living room. Maybe I should take them in and tell them all about how we got that. You're hurting, okay? You're coming up with things to try to talk about. 
And I believe Festus was in the same position that he was kind of running out of things to say to the king. And then he thought, Paul, see that in verse 14? And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause to the king, saying there's this certain man left by Felix. And, and he brings up the situation. Was he planning? It doesn't look like it. Was he tickled to death that, that Herod came and visited him? Now he can use, uh, he can pick Herod's brain on this situation. I don't think this Roman cares much in regards to the visit of this king. At this point in time, he's just running out of things to talk about. So Agrippa says unto him, um, in verse 22, then Agrippa said unto Festus, I'd also like to hear this man myself. That's what we'll do tomorrow. I have nothing on the schedule. We'll do that tomorrow. You'll get to. So tomorrow comes. And here with great pomp and ceremony, the queen and, and the king come in. And then they lead this poor little Jewish guy in, in chains into that same room. And they have a, a, a hearing. Verse 25, look at this. But when I found, continues Festus, that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appeared, appealed to Augustus, the emperor, I have determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my lord, Wherefore, I have brought him forth before you, and specially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination I might have somewhat to write. For it seemed, seemeth to me to be unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. The statement in verse 25 signifies, is significant because it shows that Festus like Felix before him, had judged that Paul had done nothing deserving of death. The Jews are crying for the death penalty. Shouting, he says, are shouting for the death penalty. And he can see nothing by which he would take a Roman citizen and put him to death. He judged just like, like Felix had before him that Paul was innocent. And sadly, that meant he had nothing on paper, no charges against Paul to send with Paul to Caesar. Festus believed that Agrippa, with his knowledge of, you know, Jewish customs, Jewish laws, um, their culture, could help Festus write out some charges that would be specific enough for Caesar Nero to consider. In his flowery speech, Festus indicates he wanted the king to examine Paul, but there's no record that the king did. You've read this text before. I bring him here that you might examine him. Does he examine him? Well, if he did, it's left out of the record. Um, in fact, before the session ended, might I be bold enough to say, Paul became the judge. And Festus and King Agrippa and Bernice became the defendants. Because that's how they behaved as they ran out of the room, as we'll see in a few verses. Now, two interesting terms for Roman royalty are found in this chapter. The first one is found in verse 25, um, and it is translated in my King James as Augustus. It is the Greek word sebastos. Sebastos is to be the top or to be worshipped, revered. And so he refers to the emperor as Sebastos in the Greek language, August, um, the 
highest. I have appealed unto August, um, says Augustus, says my King James Version. Um, some of the modern versions, modern translations, uh, insert the word emperor or imperial. Is that fair? Well, yeah. Uh, that's who they're talking about. Tell me who is above uh, Caesar Nero in Rome, in Roman political life. No one. It's the top. That's Augustus is the top. Um, the emperor is the top. And the other one is Kyrios. Um, Kyrios. You've, I'm sure, heard this word used um, before. In verse 26, of whom I have no certain thing to write, my King James says, unto my Lord. The word my is not in the Greek text anywhere. I need to write this to the Lord. And the word kyrios that's used there is the common word for Lord. It's used constantly in reference to Jesus Christ, our Master, our Lord. It's used in reference to the Father as being Lord. Um, it is a term of deity. By the way, um, Augustus, Caesar Augustus, Caesar Tiberius refused to have people refer to them as Kyrios because that is a deification. That is God himself. Um, they would not accept that title. But Nero, <laughs> read up a little bit about Nero. That's one crazy dude. Um, Nero would let people call him Kyrios and because he did, um, people began to do that because they wanted to be in front of the other guy who was just using Sebastus, and now they this one's using Lord, our, our God. Um, it's becoming a little more common. Now we move on to Paul's defense before Agrippa, Agrippa II, Herod Agrippa II, who's we're talking about, and that's this chapter before us, starting with verse 1. Then Agrippa, it says, said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before, before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. He begins off his, his uh, defense by a complimentary remarks, verses 2 and 3. And these, I don't think they are ingenerous. Um, I don't think he's making this up or just trying to say, nice outfit you got on, King. You know, I don't think he's, he's doing any of uh, cheap talk. I think he honestly means what he means. In that, standing before a Roman official, the Roman isn't going to quite get the grip of what these Jews are saying in regards to he ought to be put to death. Um, whereas Agrippa will jump right on it. He understands the culture. And so he acknowledges that by these complimentary remarks. Paul was sincere, I believe, in these compliments because he knew that Agrippa was indeed well acquainted with Jewish customs, um, Jewish controversies, which the way was a Jewish controversy. New, the new Christian church was a, was a controversy that needed to be dealt with. In addiction, Herod Agrippa II was actually a practicing Jew. He was a in the synagogue every Friday type Jew. And so um, he felt good and he felt comfortable in bringing his case before him. And then second, we see Paul's early life in Judaism. As he's giving his, his um, uh, testimony again in this book, he starts off in verse 4, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, known 
to all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most straightest sect of our religion. One commentary really cut into this and said, look at these words. In Greek, it's, it's overwhelming. Um, you don't use most straightest. The moment you say it's the straightest, that's the end of the conversation, right? You can't get any straighter than straightest, all right? But to put most straightest is as bizarre in our language as it is in the Greek language. And uh, quite a bit was said in regards to that. Most straightest sect. What's he talking about? The way. Christianity. The followers of Christ. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, I lived as a Pharisee. From my youth, I was a Pharisee, which he considers the straightest, the, the closest thing to the Bible that can be found um, is, is his in indication. And verse 6, Now I stand, I am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come, for which hope's sake King Agrippa, I'm accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you? And that's y'all. He isn't talking directly to Agrippa at that point. In the in the Greek, it's it's plural. Why do you think a thing incredible with you all that God should raise the dead? In summary. Paul asserts that from his early life he was a Pharisee, looked eagerly for the hope of Israel. What is the hope of Israel? He states it as the resurrection from the dead, which would be only a Pharisee, Pharisaic belief. It's a Pharisaic doctrine. The Sadducees and the priestly clan did not agree with this. It was the Pharisees that held to the hope of Israel that is the resurrection from the dead. This is why Christ quoted Moses. He, Jesus quotes Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6 saying, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and then Jesus points out, those guys have already gone to their graves. But they are alive today as they were back then. For we have a resurrection from the grave. The resurrection is the hope of Israel. Because Jehovah, being God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, our God, they must be resurrected in order to receive the promise God made to them. Likewise, the promises made to the Israelites demand that they be resurrected for the coming messianic age. All of Israel will enjoy the messianic age. There is coming a time in which Messiah Israel, the Messiah of Israel, will rule all of the earth and Jews will come back from the grave for that wonderful day. His <coughs> believers look forward to that same day. Paul's reference, if you take notice, in these verses, his reference to the twelve tribes of Israel, verse 7, unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God. Dana, his reference to the twelve tribes of Israel shows the air of British Israelism, Armstrongism, we used to refer to them as those that believe that the Anglos are really the lost tribes of Israel. And they... <sighs> I've met guys like this, okay? I met a guy in, in Branson, Missouri, and he kept me up late at night um, lecturing to me from the scriptures and saying, now listen, the tribe of Dan, uh-huh, is that one of the lost tribes of Israel? I said, no. Well, we don't find it in Revelation. Mm. 
he's right. <laughs> Dan isn't le listed in the book of Revelation. Well, I said, I think I can explain that. He said, but who are these people? He said, and these Danishers come and they went over the, the English Channel and they came into... We are of that lost tribe of Israel. We as Americans, we as Englishmen are of the... Oh, my soul. But let me tell you something. Paul wasn't with that. Unto which promise are twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night. I think it's well worth it. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19. Matthew. Please, I hope you have a limber Bible. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also, plural, you all also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes. Of how many tribes of Israel did Jesus believe there were? <laughs> None were lost. Um, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. We're just about there, so you might as well just turn a couple pages. Luke chapter 22 and verse 30. <clears throat> that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. At the Messianic kingdom, the twelve tribes will be represented there. James, Yaakov, James chapter 1, James, half-brother of Christ, James chapter 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is chapter 1 verse 1, and the Lord Jesus Christ, to, who's he writing to? Well, wait a minute. Hold on, you guys. We talk about the Jews. And Jews means Judea, right? The people of Judea. The, the, there are no other tribes of Israel. Well, really? Look, at, look with me, and, and we'll kind of pull this in, over to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, chapter 7. I want to look at two two places in the book of Revelation, which talk about the end times. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 4. Revelation 7 and verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of God were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtalim were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000 what did you notice Dan is not there and neither is uh, Ephraim because the Danish are up there fishing no, let me just take you to one more place and we'll, and we'll end with this. I've really said enough. More could be said in, an, in a different time. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 12, we read 21, 12. And I had a wall great and high. It had 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels. 
and the names written thereon, those twelve gates, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. Um, yes, in the, in the end times, Dan seems to be sponged from the list of the tribes. And many people have... No one says they're in Denmark. No one with, with brains say that they're in Denmark. But that many of the tribe of Dan were a part of what became the lineage for the Antichrist, the false Christ. That's what Antichrist doesn't mean he's against Christ, means he claiming to be Christ. He's the false Messiah. And we're going to, I trust, see that at uh, a later study of God's Word. Acts. Well, I took us. It's okay to jump a rabbit if you just remember where you jump that, that bunny and get back and find yourself. Yes, in verse 9, where we see the zeal in opposing the way. Verse 9. I've already thought, says Paul, with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints, the holy ones, did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice, my vote against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, to discredit the name of Jesus and being exceedingly mad berserk against them I persecuted them even into strange which is foreign cities besides being committed to Judaism Paul had also became passionate in his opposition to the followers of the way in his opposition to Christianity his casting votes against imprisoned Christians could be, mean that Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. Many Bible scholars take this verse and say he was of the Sanhedrin. He was of the council. This would mean that he was a married man because no one could be a member of the council without being married. Um, of course, the phrase can, what he said, can simply mean he agreed and gave his support to the Sanhedrin's action. How did he give support? Well, he put feet to his words and was going to Damascus to kill Christians up there, if you remember when the Lord got a hold of him. When Paul apprehended Christians, he tried to force them to blaspheme. This is a particularly ugly thing that we don't see elsewhere that he actually would work on the women children guys working on them trying to make them blaspheme the name of Jesus of Nazareth um, he's saying these things in his testimony but he's saying these things I think it still hurts him um, when he thinks on it and then the conversion and the commission um, when he trusted in the Lord. Verse, verse 12. Whereupon I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw in the way, on the path, a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when they were all, when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, Yeshua, whom thou persecutest. But arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for the purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen 
and of those things in which I will appear or show unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, the people being the nation Israel, uh, the Gentiles, of course, the nations, unto whom I now send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, the inheritance among them which are the sanctified by faith that is in me. As Paul recounted his conversion experience, he once again told of that light, light brighter than the noonday sun. Um, he mentions that in, in chapter 22 and verse 6 as well. King Agrippa, you have never seen a like to this light that we saw. It blinded Paul. He still couldn't see three days later. He had to have a, a special healing from God to be able to get usage of his eyes. Everyone that was with him, covering their faces, pulling their robes over their heads because of the brightness of Christ's presence was like the light. For the first time, the reader, you and I, are informed of the language of the heavenly host. That the heavenly host, that those angels spoke to Paul in Aramaic. Um, the word in the Greek there is Hebrew, and then the second word is dialect, which gives us our word dialect. It was of the Hebrew dialect. What is the Hebrew dialect? It's not the Hebrew language. It is a dialect of that language, which is Aramaic, Chaldean, which is what Jesus spoke, which is what the people in Jerusalem at the time of the writing of this spoke. They spoke Aramaic. And how do we know that it was in Aramaic? It tells us that it was in the Hebrew dialect. But then it reveals it in the Hebrew tongue. Saul, Saul, why persecuteth thou me? Saul, Saul. The Hebrew name Saul is Shaul. Shaul. Shaul means to ask for, to be prayed for. Isn't that a neat name uh, for a kid? We ask God to give us this child. Shaul, Shaul is, is his name. But now normally in the Greek text, it will say Saulos. Saulos is the Greek attempt at saying Shaul, okay? Saulos. And that's what we have all throughout. What, what it told, was telling us about what Saul was doing in the earlier chapters of the book of Acts, it was using Saulos. But in this text in front of you this evening, verse 14, Saul, Saul, what is written there in the Greek text is Saul. It would be, let me give it to you. It'll make it easier. Saul. Saul. Saul is the Chaldean attempt to say Shaul. Saul. They put an O in the middle of the name Saul. And it's in here. This is, this is the Greek that is in verse 14. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said in Aramaic, in the Chaldean language. Jesus spoke Chaldean with his family um, in the streets. Um, that was his mother tongue. That's what Mary spoke to him, was Chaldean, was Aramaic, and that's what he addresses um, Saul of Tarsus um, in this. That is so cool. I'm sorry, if I'm the only one that gets a real kick out of that, that is a real kicker for me, because he could have just said Saulos, Saulos, which is what Luke would have wanted to write. But Luke is attempting to give it to us in the Aramaic. And he has lived now in the area around Jerusalem for a few years, 
waiting on Paul to get out of prison, and he's picking up a lot of these things and gives us this story. Some believe that the statement, it is hard for you to kick against the goads or the pricks, mean that Paul was feeling guilty. His, he was feeling bad about, it was a violation of his conscience in persecuting uh, Christians. I'm not comfortable with that, though a number of really good um, theologians wrote that. Paul wrote later that in spite of his blasphemy, in spite of his violence, his persecution of the church, he has shown mercy because he was acting in ignorance and unbelief. He says this to the church in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. Um, so this kicking against the goads, these sharp, pointy sticks, evidently refer, referred to the futility of his attempt to persecute God's church. Oh, and he uses... Uh, I'm sorry. I, get, I really get involved in these. Um, he uses the word minister in verse uh, 16, was it? Yeah, verse 16. He uses the word minister... We use it in English, like, he's the minister. You know, doesn't that sound bigger than like a pastor or something like that? He's the minister. And so someone might say, whoa, um, he's really trying to say something big. Jesus is, is saying to make you, Saul, a minister and a witness. The word he uses there. Um, I used this one other time in this in this study. Maybe you'll remember it. He uses, um, let me put it in, in English letters. Uh, this little breath mark means put an H in there. Et tis. Um, hooper et tis. Hooper. Hyper. Remember I said you. In, when it comes into our English language, always seems to turn into a Y. So hyper, a hyperdermic needle, dermis is your skin. Hyperdermic means it sticks under the skin. Hyper, under. And then etis is to row, row, row your boat gently down the street. To row, okay? So an under row Er, an under row galley slave. The, about the worst thing that could ever happen to you in Roman society, the worst, is that they would take you and they'd take you down to a port and they'd chain you in the basement of a galley ship and until you stopped breathing you rode that ship as a slave, a galley slave, an huber etis, an under rower. And when you died, they unchained you, pulled you up to the top of the ship and threw you into the water. There was no formal notification to your family that you have have passed away or anything. It's the lowest of the lowest. A huperetis. He has made you a minister. Well, he made me a witness too. The witness there is martyr, which is, gives us our English word, martyr. One who dies for their faith. How do they witness their faith? With their very life. Jesus said, I've appeared unto you for this purpose, to make you an under rower and a martyr, both of these things which you've seen and of those things I'm going to show you later. I'm sorry, that's pretty powerful. And then verse, uh, 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 verse 19 the ministry of light to the Jew and the Gentile, the Jew and the nations. Um, 
Look at this in verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I wasn't disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but it showed first unto them of Damascus and of Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles, and they should repent and return to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continued unto this day, witnessing both to the small and to the great, saying none other things than those which the prophets of and Moses did say should come. Verse 23, And Christ, Messiah, should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the grave, the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles, the nations. <sighs> okay. This, this passage of scripture, by the way, has got theologians fussing amongst themselves. It's really, really messed up. It reads really, really nice in English. And so we can't imagine how this text could be messed up. But it is messed up. Um, I wonder if I should just say, those that would like to stay after school, I'll give you extra credit if you want to hear about this. Um, here's the situation, OK? It, it, this is difficult because it, it affirms that he spoke in, in Damascus. He gave the witness in Jerusalem, and he gave it throughout all the coasts of Judea, the lousy translation, the land, the place, the fields of Judea would be a better um, translation, and then on to the Gentiles. The problem is, is Paul affirmed already in the book of Galatians that that wasn't true. In Galatians, chapter 1 and verse 22. Galatians 1, 22, um, we read the following. Uh, quite different from what, we, what I just read to you. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 22, Paul affirms, and talking about himself, let me jump ahead by saying uh, verse 21, okay, and get a run and start into it. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face to the churches of Judea that were in Christ. In the cities of Judea, they wouldn't have even recognized my name, if, uh, my face, if it was on a wanted poster. That's what Paul is saying. They never saw me. They didn't know my face. And then he says in this text to Agrippa, yeah, I, I witnessed and I ministered in Damascus, I ministered in Jerusalem, throughout the countryside of Judea, and then I went to the nations, to the Gentiles, teaching all of them to repent. Now, okay, the two do not agree with one another. But what adds to the confusion of it, adds to the confusion of it, is that this sentence, verse 20, is a mess in Greek. It's part of the, part of the words like Damascus, Jerusalem, are in the dative. And other parts like the coasts or the lands and such of the Gentiles is in the accusative. Uh, that means nothing to the majority of you who don't know your own language well enough to speak like that. But let me just say this. A dative is a indirect object. An accusative is a direct object. Okay. Um, 
put it in English, Craig. Um, Bill gave the bone to the dog. Okay? You look at the noun, gave. Gave what? Ah, that gives me um, my accusative. That is the direct object. He's giving a bone. But the dog is an indirect object. He's the recipient of the bone. Okay? Now understand, we've got that same thing. If you can keep that in your mind long enough to look at verse 20 again, Damascus and Jerusalem are dative. And the coastlands of Judea, which is the troublesome portion of this verse in comparison to Galatians chapter 1 and verse 22, is in the accusative. It's like he's giving the land of Judea to Damascus and to, whoa, 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 this doesn't, this is bad Greek. And you know, you get scholars like Robertson, who I hold in highest esteem. He's a real strong Greek scholar. And he says, guess what? This is in the dative. This is in the accusative. That's really a mess in Greek. But I believe that's just what he wanted to say. And he, he lets it lie. He doesn't pick it up and, and wave it and go running back over to Galatians um, to, to talk about it. So, yeah, that's really for extra credit, guys. Um, probably, to, to pull it together, probably Paul just first summarized his ministry to the Jews and then described his work among the Gentiles. He affirmed much of the same in verses 17 and 18. In other words, Paul's statement here is not to be taken in strict chronological sequence. I went here, then I went here, and then I went here. He's just saying, he gives us highlights of the things that he accomplished. Furthermore, Paul asserted his message was to the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, verse 22, concerning the death, the burial and resurrection of Messiah. Frequently in Acts, the apostles also spoke of Christ's resurrection. And we close. The response of Festus and Agrippa. Verse um, 24. And he said, Thus spake to himself. Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. What's that mean? Paul, you're nuts. You're crazy. You've gone loony bin. Your much learning hath made thee mad. Verse 25. But he said, I'm not mad. I'm not crazy, most noble Festus. But I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things. Leave me out of it, says Agrippa. The king knoweth of these things, before whom I also speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know you do. When Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost, a little bit, like the word that Agrippa used, and all together such as I, except for these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor and Bernice, and they went out. They were gone, verse 31, aside to talk amongst themselves. Festus, with his Latin outlook, thought the doctrine of the resurrection from the dead? That's incredible. So he interrupted Paul. Festus, said Paul, was out of his mind. And this education is driving him insane. Nobody called Dwight L. Moody, the evangelist, crazy when he was energetically selling shoes and making money. But when he started winning souls for Christ, people gave him the nickname,
crazy moody. And that's what Festus is, is doing to Paul. He had not inter- interrupted because he really thought Paul was mad. Had he really thought he was crazy, he probably would have spoke to Paul gently. But actually, Festus was under heavy, heavy conviction. Paul clearly asserts his sanity, then turns once again to the king Agrippa. None of this, namely the Messiah's life, death, and resurrection, and the beginning of the new church, none of this could have escaped Agrippa's attention. He was highly educated. He was well-schooled in Judaism. Christianity was not some sort of a obscure, secret society. The king knew about it. So Paul pressed the issue with fourth white right question. King, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do, said Paul. Now Agrippa's in the corner. If he truly believed the prophets, he would be forced to admit that Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled all of the prophecies. His only escape was deflect the question with a question of his own. The NIV translation of verse 28 says, I think it translates it very well, Agrippa's answer, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? I think he was laughing when he said that. He was teasing. But Paul took his response seriously, for he earnestly desired that the king repent of his sin and would follow the Savior. Even if it took a long time for this to happen, says Paul, Paul was willing to take that time. He replied, he prayed that Agrippa and all the people listening to him would become like him, a Christian. And then I think Paul smiled and said, accept these chains. That you had everything I have, except the chains. Then why did Agrippa suddenly stand up and go outside? The same reason some people squirm and leave their seats today when under conviction of the gospel. You see it on a Sunday morning. Their seat suddenly gets too hot for them, and they're out of the room. What was Herod Agrippa's verdict? If indeed he was judging Paul. Paul neither deserved the death penalty, nor was he a criminal, is Herod's understanding. This man, quote, is doing nothing deserving of death and chains. He agreed with the others who had already declared Paul was innocent. Do you remember? The Pharisees said that in chapter 23 and verse 9. Claudius Lysia said that Paul was innocent in chapter 23, verse 29. Governor Festus in chapter 25 and verse 25. Now Agrippa, a man of power, well trained in Judaism, sympathetic with the Jews, said, this man could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. So I ask you, had Paul made a mistake by appealing to the judgment of Caesar? Well, Paul would have been released. He would be free right now. But first, the Roman guards would no longer have protected him against the assassins. Second, Paul would have lost his Roman guard escorted all expense trip to Rome that he's going to get in just a few verses, which is precisely where the Lord wanted him to go. So listen to me. If you catch nothing else, catch this. True freedom is rarely physical. Freedom is being in the center of God's will for our lives, even if it means chains. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for what you've taught us through your word this day. Thank you for these men. Some of us might be facing this in the near future. We don't know what is in store for us. But I pray that the things that we've learned this evening might stay with us, that we might truly be free because your Son has made us free. We give you praise in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.